Imagine this, swallowed by suburbia. Just a couple of kids falling in love with something can actually go big. We just thought, well, we just have to do this. Tonight, the story of a wild place saved and the billionaire couple who made it happen with the gift of a lifetime. I didn't believe what I was hearing. I, it was unbelievable. This was a piece of good news, a big piece of good news. Protecting our world isn't a spectator sport. Everyone needs to get involved. Everyone needs to be a leader. California, close to 40 million people are crammed in here, 10 million of them in Los Angeles County alone. Just up the road though, is a very different slice of California a unique place that's just been saved from development by a couple of very private billionaires who were so reclusive that barely anyone's ever heard of them outside their industry. It's truly a miracle that this landscape, this property, exists in its natural form still. Its special location and geography and this, this west-facing coastline and south-facing coastline and Point Conception just made for these conditions where there's incredible amount of biodiversity here uh, and an extraordinary set of natural communities. So it was no surprise that people wanted to protect this. this these spots are well known and coveted in the California surf community. And, um, Mike Bell yeah, works for the Nature Conservancy, an environmental organisation that raises money to buy up tracts of land all over the world. Their policy of partnering with big business is sometimes controversial. So we've taken criticism on working with certain companies, but if a, a company approaches us and seems sincere uh, and acts sincerely with us to, to really develop a solution, um, We'll keep working with them. This place is not just a beauty spot and a haven for plants and animals. There are hundreds of sites of historic significance here. Spanish explorers called this headland Point Conception. For the Native American Chumash, though, it was a place for the end of life. Its waters the portal to enter the next world. This is eight to nine miles of just, you know, incredibly pristine coastline where the animals that utilize the coast, that includes bears and sea lions and seals, they have this sort of intact, quiet place that is unlike any other part of the Southern California coastline. Jack and Laura Dangerman were barely more than kids when they drove along this same road, Pacific Highway 1, on their honeymoon and fell in love with this coastline, just like everybody else. Back 
then they had nothing, just each other and an idea. But 50 years later, they're multi-billionaires. And having made their fortune, Jack and Laura are using their wealth to set an example for the common good. We're on our way to meet them. Hey, Michael. Hey, <laughs> nice to see you, see you really again. Good. Hey, here we go. Should <laughs> I park over here? Right over there. All right. Good morning. Good morning. Hey, Michael. Hey. Nice to see you. Great to see you. Wow. It's Glad been a you're while. finally here. I know. It's amazing. <laughs> this is the first time the Dangermonds have visited the Jack and Laura Dangermon <laughs> Preserve since the deal went through. Yeah, I think we're going to park here okay. and do a little tour. All right. And then hit, uh, then get back to the Coho headquarters okay. and right. have lunch. Yeah. We, okay. um, and so, one question is: Do we want to hop in a truck or do we want to hop in an open UTV? They spent their honeymoon camping just down the road, 52 years ago. A couple of young, idealistic, and broke students. Needless to say, we have great memories of the, the beach front there. Um, and it was a place where I think, I would say we both fell in love oh, with yeah. that place. It's, it's just spectacular. Mm -hmm. Now, all these years later, the gift of 165 million US dollars is the biggest ever received by the Nature Conservancy. Mike had a key role in clinching the deal. Finding Michael was a gift because he's not a normal person. Mm -hmm. He's really extraordinary in his, both his passion but also his ability to organize and make things happen. I don't have any one word to tell you what Jack Dangerman's like. He's uh, energetic, brilliant, um, tireless. Jack and Laura are visiting in midsummer as fires rage across California. The state's largest ever fire is burning and Yosemite National Park is also threatened. It brings home the fragility and urgency of what they're trying to do. Yeah, and this is the driest time, August. Sure is. Yeah. But even if in its dryness, you get this sort of a gray, mm -hmm. green, yellow, it's an amazing color combination. Mm -hmm. Even dry as it is, the property, at around 10,000 hectares, remains stunningly beautiful and all but untouched. There's no sound here. Yeah. And I was just noticing how yeah. amazing it is. No car noise. To be without sound. For more than 100 years, the land behind me was a working ranch, eyed by developers and eventually acquired by a Boston hedge fund with plans to subdivide it for the rich and famous. But when the hedge fund ran into trouble with California's rigid environmental laws, the Dangermonds and the Nature Conservancy swooped, stunning the international conservation community. And that was always the plan to grab attention. We chose, in this case, not to be anonymous because we hoped that we would get the energy from it. And I think that we are getting it. It's, so it's, it's not worth... a natural thing for you, is it? No, no. Because <laughs> you'd rather be uh, quiet. Yeah, quiet and not have anyone notice. Mm -hmm. um, so it was hard to make that decision. And then, you know, when we decided to do it, it was scary. And still, it's a little scary having people know. Uh, but on the other hand, I think it's worth it. I do. And we only have a limited amount of time left to do these things. So I think we have to let people know. Time is running out. It's, um, it's late in the day. It's not dark yet, but it's late in the day. And people are going to have to move um, to do this kind of thing in small ways and large ways all over the planet really quickly. <laughs> Thank you. 
the Dangermons run their tech business from this little Californian town of Redlands, where they grew up. They set up their digital mapping company, Esri, in 1969, with savings of just $2,000. It's since been valued by Forbes at more than five and a half billion. We just simply made a startup, and it's just very gradually grown up to become, I guess you would call it the world leader in geographic information systems today. Geographic Information Systems, or GIS, creates complex layered maps that are used by governments and business to help visually interpret a problem or issue. I like maps. Uh, they are kind of a language. They are the language of geography, the language of um, human activities, the language of understanding. So when you look at a, some text, you sort of understand through text an idea that somebody's trying to communicate. When you look at a picture, it's worth a thousand words, they say, but a map is, we think, worth a million words because you see context as well as the content. The Dangermons came of age in the 60s as the Californian counterculture was blossoming. but they chose their own unique road. This thought occurred to us that our role is not to go to the right or go to the left or protest or act out. It's uh, what, it, what is attractive to us is rational thinking. And that appeals to me. Uh, it appeals to Laura. I think it's really more her than me, you know, not being out, out there trying to, to be interesting, but being interested. So anybody can try to look interesting, how they dress up or whatever it is, but to be genuinely interested in helping other people be successful and do their work. This has, I think, been one of the big yeah, ingredients of our success. I think helping success. other people be successful because we have the tool to do that. Miraculously, this public beach right next to the Jack and Laura Dangemon Preserve has been spared from development, a relic of the California of old. It's easy to see why people love this stretch of coastline. Thousands of families escape the rat race every summer, coming to this campground just next to the ranch for this beach and these world famous burgers. So why don't you give your sister the price so you don't drop yeah. There you go. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Apart from this one public beach, much of the coast around here is privately owned by the wealthy and that's controversial. The preserves beaches will also be off limits to the public, but at least the land will stay undeveloped. I like it because we got enough housing. We don't need to put up any more developments. I mean, anywhere they got a chance to put up a development, they shove something in there. So I like it. I mean, I would like it all just to stay how it is. It's beautiful. It definitely has a different feeling when you're here because there's nothing on the, on the cliff. There's, you know, there's this shack and the ranger station, and that's kind of it. Oil rigs are a constant reminder of industry along the coast. Tar spills onto the beach from natural undersea seeps. But in 2015, a corroded pipeline spilt hundreds of thousands of litres of oil into the region's protected marine areas. President Donald Trump wants to open up more of this coast to offshore drilling, despite strong local opposition. Was the, the timing of this purchase in any way related to the current state of American politics and particularly the actions of Donald Trump on various environmental issues? No, not at all. What about the community reaction and welcoming of what happened 
that's entirely related. <laughs> the news hit fast and suddenly, and it was a big news for conservation. Uh, and conservation hadn't been getting a lot of good news lately. There's been a lot of controversies about our uh, national monuments um, and about a lot of environmental protection uh, regulation that we had in place. Um, and this was a piece of good news. And um, it was a big piece of good news. Leaving a legacy is often a story. It's about creating a story of conservation. As human development encroaches on these remaining areas of high biodiversity, like this ranch, I think we, we need to step up the storytelling so that people say, I could make a difference. And young, many young people that I talk to want to do it. I mean, I get so excited just looking at it. <laughs> well, this is your first time back. It is. What's yeah. that like? Well, you know, we live a more or less urban life. And so getting in this kind of space is, ah, picks you up. But you know, when you look at, like, you look at that and you think, well, you know, it could have been cut down or houses yep. could have been and built. And we have seen and... it, Zoe. We've seen them cut down yeah. near us, in, near our town. A, a force mm. exactly like this, as a matter of fact. I think the, the idea of not developing every square foot of land in California is part of where we're coming from here, is that, no, this should not be developed, ever. Does the enormity of what you've done strike you at all? Well, uh, considering the kind of problems that we're facing globally, um, it doesn't seem so big. I mean, we're challenged with climate change and loss of biodiversity. This is kind of like a little small footprint. And it has to be replicated lots and lots more. And we also have to address all the big challenges that our world is facing right now. It's not just about the environment. The Danger Mons mapping systems are helping solve other challenges, like LA's massive homeless problem. More than 57,000 people, many of them young, are on the streets every night. With its partners, Esri has mapped 25 cities, collecting complex real-time data so that outreach and beds can be matched to people who need them. Having all that information available in, uh, to policymakers leaves them no excuse for not making good policy. And good decisions. And good decisions. Yeah. It, it adds to the transparency of the way people behave. So if I really, in a social setting, like in a city or in a nation, um, if we have all the science there and people are still making stupid decisions, then you can call politicians or decision makers on the carpet, so to speak, because we've got documented evidence that this is the way, not that. And yeah. There's no excuse. When The Nature Conservancy began in 1951, it had a simple idea to buy up land and protect it from development. Over the years, it's embraced more and more partnerships with big business, looking at solutions to all kinds of issues. The environmental problems we have on this earth are profound. They're created by our own economic activity to provide for ourselves and our families. And companies and corporations play a big role in that. And these are massive, you know, multinational corporations doing this. They're at a very large scale. We need to work at that large scale. We can't simply expect to find large scale answers by working at small scale. So, so we will work with, you know, the, the largest companies in the private sector and the biggest governments on earth to try to do that. The cattle ranch that's been on this land for more than a hundred years will stay for now. Grazing reduces fire risk and weeds and buys the Nature Conservancy time to plan the next steps. 
and while limited grazing will continue, eventually it's hoped the land will be returned to close to its original state and become a hub for research. Our philosophy is we need to really drive forward with information and science that can help people understand and then act differently. So this language of maps, it all ties back to that. Maps are a way of telling stories. So we have great authors, they tell stories, they did it hundreds of years ago and we even still read their books because their stories are so charming and interesting. The kind of stories that have to be told today are getting society aware that some phenomena are changing in such a way that it's not gonna be sustainable on the planet to live here anymore. Uh, and, and then we've gotta be able to take action. And it's not just one person doing action, it's not just a president or a premier or somebody like that taking action, it's really us as a body taking action. I think the lesson that Jack and Laura uh, put out here to people um, is that protecting our world isn't a spectator sport. Everyone needs to get involved. Everyone needs to be a leader. Jack and Laura are in their 70s. Their gift is huge, and their hope is that it may lead to something even bigger, a shift in the public consciousness about the way we all live, large or small, rich or poor. What I see is necessary is the reprogramming of the way people think. Uh, and that's at the economic level, at the behavioral level, at all levels, so that they get aware of uh, that we need to do conservation in every way possible. Plant one more tree, protect one more thing, uh, play at all levels. This is the big copycat uh, reason why I think we went, we wanted to go public on it. A lot of people invest in famous paintings, you know, a Mondrian or a Van Gogh. Um, this is a real painting, you know, and it's a fraction of the price. <laughs> so, I mean, to be able to buy to be able to buy this whole reserve was the price of one of these paintings. Well, and more can grow and more can grow, and it'll be here forever. Yeah. That's exactly right. Yeah.